good morning everyone so my task today is just to give you a brief introduction on how to get started in research uh, i have been questioning myself as to why i have to keep on giving this talk and then i realized that as newer and newer generations of doctors passed out uh, we have to tell every one of them about the importance of doing research before i get on to how to get started in research let's look at why we have to do research as uh, the president dr padma gunaratne said we are all medical professionals or medical academics and we have three functions a service function which we perform at our places of work in hospitals laboratories and so on we also should disseminate knowledge in our area of expertise which we do by teaching undergraduates or training our postgraduates but a third and important thing for a medical professional or an academic is that we have to strive to generate knowledge in our area of expertise that is generate new knowledge and generating new knowledge is by doing research research i feel is important for all doctors whether you are a university based doctor working in a hospital ward or an outpatient department or a lab because doing research helps you to learn a very valuable discipline and that is scientific method even if you stop doing research after some time once you learn scientific method this enables you to read other people's research critically because you know scientific method you can read other people's research very critically and this will assist you to make informed and evidence based practices you can look at a paper and say the methodology used in this paper is good i am therefore going to accept the conclusions and change my practice which is what we call evidence based practice and as you know as medical professionals evidence based practice just improve, improves our performance example in patient care we will not give patients unnecessary medication we won't do unnecessary investigations and so on so research even if you do only a little is important for all doctors because it helps you to learn this very valuable lesson called scientific method and doctors do do research in sri lanka if you look at the number of publications in different discipline and this is from saival you can see that more than 25% of all papers that were indexed in saival during a five year period were medical research so of all research publications in this country that were indexed by saival or analyzed by saival in its in scopus more than 25% were medical research and even if you look at science citation index expanded and we are going a little higher now and saying journals with an impact factor of at least 1 you can see that medical dental and veterinary sciences almost equal the sum of all other publications from other fields of science so medical professionals do do research in our country and that is very hard to but the qualitative assessment of sri lankan medical research is a bit more disappointing because most medical research in sri lanka has been and still is it's changing a little now but is small scale and descriptive saroj jaising in 2012 showed that less than 5% of abstracts that were submitted to the sri lanka medical association academic sessions which is our premier medical conference were intervention less than 
most of the others were just descriptive. And Rana Singh and colleagues publishing a paper in 2012, I know this is old, but it still holds somewhat true. They found that the type of article that gives you high citations like systematic reviews and randomized control trials, less than 10% of all our publications. Most of our publications are descriptive studies, letters to the editor, case reports, and so on. So I think there needs to be a little change also in the way we do research from merely being descriptive to trying to be interventional. So now let's get on with that little background. How does a young doctor start a research project. Not only a young doctor, maybe even an older doctor, but how do you start a research project? The first thing you have to decide is what area of research you want to work in. In other words, what is the problem you want to find an answer to? Now that is easier said than done because we may have a lot of ideas as to what research problems we want to answer. But most of the time, you will not get your own way. Because when you join an institution or department to do research, that institution or department will have its own research priorities. So for example, if you come to my department in Ragam and say you want to do some really good research in pulmonary diseases with me, I will say, sorry, you know, I, I'm not doing research in that area. If you want to work with me, you have to do something on hepatology. One's own choice is only rarely possible. And, and that is, if you have funding. So if someone comes to a department and says, I've got a grant to do research in this area, and I want a department and a lab to work in, you may find a more positive answer from that department than if you didn't have any funds because the department and the institution are funded for research in other areas already established. So whatever way you choose it, either an institution or department priority or your own choice, there are two important questions that you must ask yourself at the outset, at the very beginning. Is the area of research that I chose relevant? Is it a useless bit of research that no one will care about? Number two, is it feasible? Do I have the expertise around me to do this? Are there resources for me to do it? It may be the best idea on earth, but if you can't implement it, then you shouldn't start it. So remember when you choose the area of research, be it due to an institutional or departmental priority or your own choice, just ask yourself the two questions. Is this relevant? Is what I'm doing important for the country or internationally? And do I think I can do this? Is it feasible? The research strategy that we in relatively resource limited settings should use is one of adaptation. I don't call our country a resource poor setting anymore. I use the word relatively resource limited setting because there are countries very much more resource, resource, resource limited than Sri Lanka. So we cannot always have this excuse of saying we don't have resources to do research. But I accept that we are relatively resource limited. So adapting to this is to be realistic. For example, we shouldn't try to compete with developed Western countries in basic sciences, like trying to find a gene for a rare illness. But we can what we can focus on are problems that are common and relevant locally, but rare in the West, which may interest people in the West if we want their help. 
because sometimes you have to seek foreign collaboration for example for laboratory based studies or doing something or doing an investigation which is not available in our country so this is what i mean by adaptation don't try to compete with the best focus on problems that are relevant locally that may interest other international scientists and it then becomes easy to seek for in collaboration and by listen to the younger people is a appeal actually please have confidence to do interventional studies don't take the easy way out by just doing a small descriptive studies now once you have decided what area of research you want to work on your lab and your institution agrees with you you have decided it's relevant and it's feasible and you're not competing with big labs in developed countries you no know, it's uh, you are adapted to a situation and so on what you then have to do is the most important lesson from my talk acquire a wide knowledge regarding your chosen area of research and that is by doing a review of the literature it is very easy to do literature reviews now when you are president and we for medical students and young doctors we have to go to libraries and go through these giant books called index medicus and we most of us develop wheezing after going through these dusty volumes now we don't have to do that there are cd rom systems internet search engine that's an overload of information about anything and everything so what has now happened is that it's not difficult to get the literature in an area that you want to do research in but there is now an information overload so you will have about 5 600 papers in the area that you want to research in downloaded on your computer so how on earth are you going to make sense of all these papers and my answer will be advice to you again is to use these refer these papers that you have downloaded in the literature review and write a well reference essay on the topic of your research sit down go through those papers and write a well reference essay on your topic because this will help you acquire historical data or all the past work that has been done so you will not needlessly repeat what has already been done it will help you to identify unanswered questions in your area of research then among those questions you can decide what can be researched by you remembering what i said about relevance and feasibility and then develop your hypothesis and writing this essay is not a waste of time it is usually the first chapter in a thesis an introduction to your paper or an introduction to your paper it is never a waste to sit down and write down an essay 3 4000 words going through all the literature and that will help you overcome this information overload that we have these days once you have done that you have to now develop what we call a detailed research plan and I, and my advice to you is at this early time in your plan get advice and opinions from your supervisor other relevant experts like statisticians and senior colleagues i think it is important to share your share your ideas and say what do you think about this i feel this is relevant i think it's feasible but what do you think and getting that advice and opinion should be earlier than later because if you go far down in your research plan before you get a negative opinion then you have wasted a lot of your time because time is important don't forget the time factor we don't have time all the time in the world to do only research as doctors we have world work we have other things in our life so remember the time factor especially for pg trainees you have a finite time to finish this research and 
senior colleagues and supervisors are experienced to say, look, I don't think you can do this in one year. Or, yep, I think you can do this in six months, so go ahead. So get advice and opinion early. And then with that, you have to discuss all the details of the project, which will be uh, talked about in detail by the other speakers today. The objectives of your research, I think the objective should be clear. And after you have done this, writing this essay after the literature review, found the unanswered questions, and among them you have found what questions you think you can answer, the objective should be very clear in your mind. And I also feel there should be as few as possible. If you have 25 objectives in a research project, it will definitely fail. You have to discuss the methodology. What type of study you are going to do? Is it a community-based or hospital-based? The population, the randomization of people into the study. If you are doing a lab-based study, details of lab tests. If you are doing a clinical trial, medications, the route, the dose, all the details of the methodology of your study has to be discussed early on. And then, of course, this important thing called statistics, where sample size, what test to use in the analysis of results, a priori, that is before you finish the research, you decide these are the tests that I'm going to use for analyzing my results. And sample size, which will be, I think, the two lectures down from mine, they are very, very important because you don't want to do a very nice randomized clinical trial and then for the journal to say, look, this is a very nice trial, but the sample size is too small. I don't think your findings are valid. Also don't forget to discuss ethics. All research, not only medical, must conform to accepted ethical standards. And of course the budget. You have to make a detailed breakdown of expenses with provision for inflation not all good research is expensive. There are some clinical studies you can do which are not very expensive at all. But if you are using a clinical, if you're doing a clinical trial and you're using some lab tests or purchasing some medications and so on, there will be expenses. So discuss the budget as well. So not only the, the main things in the paper, like the objectives, methods, and so on, but also ethics and the budget. The budget is important because very high quality research is usually not possible without proper funding. And to do that, you have to learn to write a convincing grant proposal. And that is the other important thing about writing this essay and having a good research plan which you have discussed with your seniors because you can then convert this research plan to a very good grant proposal. So you do not waste time by sitting down and writing things down. And again, I want to remind you that ethics approval is a prerequisite to receive funds from most of the recruited funding agencies. So Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, if I may summarize my talk this morning, I feel when you start out doing research, choose a research project that is relevant and feasible. Don't forget the time factor. Acquire knowledge regarding the chosen area of research. Do not venture into a research project without doing this. So a good literature survey, an essay will be very, very useful. And it is not, I repeat, not a waste of time. Remember to discuss scientific details as well as ethics and budget with supervisors and senior colleagues. And you must try to secure funding if it is a major trial, like an interventional trial. And to do that, you have to learn to write a convincing grant proposal. Thank you. Uh, 
Professor Janaka De Silva, there is uh, one question. There are a few questions, but I want to ask you one question yep. uh, from Veera Singh Vijay Ratna. Please advise how to find out fake journals. All right, okay. So that was another part of a lecture that I gave uh, added to this, to the College of Pediatrician. So there are these. Uh, I don't think we should use the word fake. They are called predatory journals, right? So predatory journals are very difficult to distinguish. And the safest bet for a young researcher would be to stick to journals that are indexed in either Science Citation Index Scopus or PubMed, uh, or sorry, in uh, Scopus, because those reputed indexers usually don't have predatory journals. Universities have also uh, started having what they call white lists of journals. These are journals that they do not consider predatory. Uh, I know the University of Runa was the pioneer in doing this and they have their list and the University of Kalania has recently uh, uh, started having a white list of journals to help young people. So my answer, predatory journals, very difficult to distinguish, stick to indexed journals. And if you are ever invited by a Chinese woman called Susie Wang or some such name on an email, then I think it's better that you avoid such journals. They will say, hello, you're a great scholar. You would love to publish your article and, and so on. Those are the things that you have to avoid. Thank you, uh, Chanaka. There is another question. How would you different? I mean, what is the difference between thesis and an original article? Well, I think that's that's uh, a thesis is a thing that you do to earn a research degree. And if it's a PhD, there are several original articles put together for a PhD thesis. For an MPhil, it may be one or two. Whereas an original article can be just one area of research, one research project which you write up as an original paper and publish in a journal. Okay. So, and, and you don't get any uh, degree for doing that. A thesis is something you do once you register for a research degree in a university. It's a much bigger uh, thing than just an original research paper. Yeah. Again, the another question is: Is it all right to do research on an already done area as a uh, result comparing research? Yeah. So that is where this essay comes in. Now, when you read the write the essay after reading the literature, and you f want to find whether drug A is useful for disease B, and all the literature in the past is showing, yes, it is useful, then it will be superfluous or un un redundant, un unnecessary for you to do it again. But if some studies show that drug A works for disease B, and some trials show that it doesn't work, then there's a question in the mind of the medical community then you can say, because there's a controversy regarding this drug, I'm going to do another clinical trial to try to answer this. Then it is all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Janaka de Silva. Thank you, Janaka, uh, for that excellent presentation and laying the foundation uh, for our workshop. Uh, that's an excellent presentation. And uh, uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, let me communicate our sincere gratitude to you for this contribution towards our workshop. Thank you.